This is where I work, the Institute of Metabolic Science in Cambridge, and in it my lab addresses two questions. Firstly, why are some people fat and some people not? And secondly, when you do become obese, why do you become ill? In the talk today, I'll very briefly touch upon the first question and spend most of my short time on the second, and possibly end with a little mention of the intersection between obesity and the COVID epidemic. So broadly, obesity is due to gene-environment interaction, and what we've discovered over the last 20 years is that those genes are largely expressed in the central nervous system. When there's famine, nobody is obese, and when food is restricted, very few are. But in conditions of food superabundance that we currently have, then a large range of individuals become obese to a variable extent, largely dependent on their genetic inheritance. And what we've learned about those genes from studies of large populations, but also of rare individuals, is firstly that they're mostly brain-expressed genes, and many of those, when we study them, affect appetite. And what we've learned in detail is that the leptin melanocortin system deep in the hypothalamus of the brain is a critical regulatory system uh, uh, in this whole process. I'll just share with you briefly some impressed data from a study we've been doing on one of the key elements of that system, the melanocortin 4 re re receptor. We studied it with colleagues in Bristol in a birth cohort, the, most, the best way of studying the, a, a disorder's prevalence because you're not selecting for anything. You're just selecting an, a, a group of people born in a particular year, in this case, 1991. And there we found that about one in every 330 people had a loss of function mutation in the melanocortin 4 receptor. That's up to 200,000 if we estimate for the UK and maybe as many as 20 million people in the world. The thing that we found astonishing is that the impact and the size of the impact of carrying that. Every carrier on average carried an 18 kilogram weight uh, gain into uh, adult life at the age of 18, 14 kilos of which was fat. So this really means we need to focus down on this population who are entering life with this huge weight uh, uh, disadvantage. And now that we know the genetic uh, uh, cause, cause here, we can design appropriate therapies to try and bypass this defect. So to move on to the adverse consequences of, uh, uh, health, of, of, of overnutrition, firstly, uh, um, we'd like to say that really obesity is simply a result of the chronic imbalance between energy intake and energy expenditure. And the expanded mass and volume of triglyceride in adipocytes is what's directly responsible for those mechanical and gravitational effects of obesity. But it's hard to see how that, could, the, that mass could directly impinge on things like the risk of cancer and metabolic disease. And perhaps obesity there, the mass, is just a biomarker for this chronic excess of energy intake over energy expenditure. So central to these metabolic disorders is the problem of insulin resistance slash hyperinsulinemia. And an understanding of how in, insulin, overnutrition leads to insulin resistance is really a holy grail for the understanding of why obesity is bad for us. So how do we get to, from sustained positive energy balance to defective glucose handling in liver and muscle, which are the key tissues for insulin action? If you asked a thousand diabetologists at the moment, they'd probably uh, answer you, it's because of these inflammatory cells in fat and all these adipocytokines. And animal model research would, would strongly support that. But I would like to say that there's very little uh, human genetic evidence or indeed human pharmacological evidence for, to support this notion as being critical as the link in humans, or at least the key link is in humans. And better evidence is emerging for another model. And that model is that our fat cell is the safest place to put our, our excess energy. And when we start reaching the limits of safe storage in that fat cell, we start redirecting nutrients to those non-professional nutrient storage tissues. And that's where the mischief really starts. And a very good model of this are people who are born with an inadequate adipose store. These people are born with inability to make triglyceride or inability to make fat cells. They have so-called lipodystrophy. So, <clears throat> They're not obese, but they develop all the metabolic complications of obesity because they redirect all those nutrients away into those non-professional stores. Together with my colleague David Savage and other collaborators over the years, we've discovered many of the genes causing uh, uh, lipodystrophy. But I'm going to take you to one rare example, just because it's a beautiful example of how, what sorts of mechanisms might be going on, how it might be more broadly significant. 
people with a mutation in perilipin 1, which knock off, knocks off this mutation, which messes up the very end, the so-called C-terminus, develop a very specific and severe form of metabolic syndrome and lipodystrophy. And they do so for the following reasons. Perilipin lives on the surface of the, of the lipid droplets, only in white fat cells. There it lives with its partner, CGI58. And when you're being fed, it just sits there doing nothing, and your triglyceride droplet makes fat. But overnight, in the middle of the night, when you need your free fatty acids to keep your heart fueled, you get a phosphorylation event, hormonally induced at the C-terminus, that kicks off CGI58, that kicks the lipase that breaks down triglyceride, and you have this beautiful coordination of fatty acid delivery to your body to allow your heart to keep working overnight. Without that, you'll be in real trouble. But these unfortunate people just have one messed up copy of perilipin. All day, every day, they have this molecule floating around, grabbing down the lipase and making them make fatty acids that they deliver to the body. And that alone is enough to lead to every abnormality we see in obesity. So this constant release of free fatty acid from the adipocyte is sufficient in itself to lead to uh, the, the, the metabolic syndrome. Is this relevant to more common disease? Well, we tried to ask that in collaboration with our colleagues at the MRC Epidemiology Unit by getting a composite score of metabolic syndrome associated with fasting insulin, low HDL, and high triglyceride, and finding 53 common variants that impacted on that. And here they are here, uh, as defined in red, red for high, blue for low, red for high. Looking at different populations, the independent studies, yes, these SNPs are associated with worse coronary artery disease and worse diabetes. But looking at them against body fat measures, it's really surprising. They seem to be associated with leanness, not with obesity. And so when we take these into a DEXA scanned population, near over nearly 13,000, and ask if you carry these risky SNPs, do they give you a, a big belly? Well, not really. The bellies aren't that much bigger. What do they give you? They give you a small bottom. They, they, and they, they give you a low fat in the legs, low fat in the gynoid uh, out region. So really we're talking about these risk sn uh, SNPs in the general population, preventing safe accumulation of fat on the safe areas, the legs and buttocks, rather than driving them into the uh, uh, visceral fat, fat that we so often talk about. And therefore, I often use this model to try and explain this to a lay audience. If you're, you've got a bathroom where somebody's left the tap on and left it plug, plug out and there's a mat uh, uh, on the bottom, everything is healthy because you store the triglyceride there. And we think usually about obesity diseases as a following way. People eat too much, take in too much food, or expend too little energy, and then the bath overflows and you get the soggy carpet. But of course, we think far too little, I believe, about the fact that not everyone has the same size bath. In other words, people are born with varying degrees of adipose storage capacity. And so for some people, they can remain healthy while being, being very obese. Others become sick um, uh, with, with, uh, limited, with, with have limited adipose storage uh, uh, capacity and develop all the, the, those problems. And we're moving from this as a generality into very much more specific areas of research uh, at the moment, looking at rare variants. This one is called ALK7. It's present in one and two in every thousand people. When you have it, you have a, a higher, a lower waist hip ratio. You have a lower risk of diabetes. And when you have that mutant, that mutant messes up the signaling of ALK7. And <clears throat> what that means is that if we develop a drug against ALK7, that may protect against the metabolic consequences of overnutrition. <clears throat> Finally, everything I've talked to you about you today about the metabolic consequences of obesity, the insulin resistance, the pro-inflammatory states, all impact greatly on this challenge of our time, COVID-19, its cause of death through the terrible pulmonary pathology. And in my longer talk, you'll be able to see uh, a, a more detailed exposition of how obesity may, may lead to the exacerbations of this, uh, this illness through, the, through a range uh, of mechanisms. So thank you for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the meeting.